this video, we will explore the processes of respiration in detail for the standard level. We will look at the structure and formation of ATP, the types of cellular respiration, the interconversion of ATP and ADP, the respiratory substrates, factors affecting respiration rate and respirometers. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate and it plays a central role in cell biology. ATP is a nucleotide made of adenine, a ribose sugar and three phosphate groups. It serves as the primary energy carrier in cells. In other words, it acts as the energy currency of the cell. It stores and distributes energy for cellular processes like muscle contraction, movement of cell components such as chromosomes, synthesis of macromolecules, in other words anabolism, and active transport. What makes ATP ideal for this role is that the bond between the second and third phosphate group is easily broken, releasing a small, manageable amount of energy. This makes ATP highly efficient as energy can be released quickly and in controlled amounts where and when it's needed. Respiration is the process by which chemical energy is released from organic molecules, primarily glucose, and transferred to the readily available chemical energy stored in adenosine triphosphate. It is important to clarify that we are discussing cellular respiration, not gaseous exchange. Gaseous exchange in humans occurs in the lungs, where oxygen is absorbed into the bloodstream to support aerobic cellular respiration, and carbon dioxide, a waste product of respiration, is expelled. Cells can carry out two types of cellular respiration, aerobic and anaerobic. Aerobic respiration, which requires oxygen, can be summarised by the equation. Glucose plus oxygen goes to carbon dioxide plus water plus ATP. Approximately 38 molecules of ATP are produced in this process. In the absence of oxygen, anaerobic respiration occurs. Anaerobic respiration is the process by which chemical energy is released from glucose and transferred to ATP without using oxygen. However, its efficiency is much lower, producing a net yield of only two ATP molecules per glucose molecule. In humans, anaerobic respiration occurs when oxygen supply is insufficient, such as during intense exercise. In this process, lactic acid is produced as a byproduct, which can accumulate in muscles and contribute to fatigue. Anaerobic respiration takes place entirely in the cytoplasm, whereas aerobic respiration begins in the cytoplasm but primarily occurs in the mitochondria, where most ATP is generated. During respiration, ATP is synthesised from ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and inorganic phosphate, PI. This process occurs as the chemical energy stored in biological molecules, such as glucose, is released and converted into the chemical energy stored in the high-energy bond between ADP and inorganic phosphate. Water is released during this reaction, so it is a condensation reaction. The breakdown, or hydrolysis of ATP, back into ADP and inorganic phosphate, releases energy. The continuous interconversion between ATP and ADP ensures a steady supply of energy to sustain life processes. The primary substrate for respiration is the monosaccharide glucose, as it is the molecule most readily metabolised by cells. When glucose levels in the blood are low, Fatty acids can also serve as a significant substrate for respiration, particularly in tissues like muscle and liver. If both glucose and fatty acids are unavailable, cells can utilise other biological molecules as substrates for respiration. These include amino acids derived from protein breakdown or other metabolic intermediates, ensuring that energy production can continue under various conditions. Like photosynthesis, the rate of respiration is influenced by several factors which we will now look at. One of these is the size of the organism. 
smaller organisms have a larger surface area to volume ratio, leading to greater heat loss. To compensate, they require a higher metabolic rate, which increases their rate of respiration. Another factor is the activity level of cells. Highly active cells, such as muscle cells, require more ATP to sustain energy-demanding processes like movement. This results in a higher rate of respiration compared to less active cells. Temperature is a limiting factor of respiration. It affects respiration rate similarly to that of photosynthesis. You can see in this graph that initially as temperature increases, the kinetic energy of molecules also increases. This leads to more successful collisions between enzyme molecules and substrates, which increases the rate of reaction. This continues until the optimum temperature is reached. At this point, the rate of respiration has reached its maximum, so this is the temperature where enzyme activity is most efficient. After reaching the optimum temperature, further increases in temperature can cause the enzyme molecules to denature. The high kinetic energy of the molecules puts stress on the bonds of the enzyme, disrupting its active site and reducing its ability to catalyse the reaction. This is reflected by the downward slope of the curve. This overall curve of the respiration rate against temperature is a combination of the increased rate of reaction due to increased collisions between enzyme and substrate and the breaking down of the structure of the enzyme due to the stress put on the bonds due to the increase in kinetic energy. pH is another limiting factor. The rate of respiration is influenced by pH due to its effect on the enzymes involved in the process. Here's how pH affects enzyme activity and consequently respiration. Enzymes have an optimal pH range at which their active sites are in the best shape for binding to substrates. When the pH deviates from the optimal range, either becoming too acidic or too alkaline, the bonds holding the enzyme structure together can break and the enzyme becomes denatured. The change in pH affects the charges on the amino acids, reducing the enzyme's ability to bind substrates properly, thus decreasing the rate of respiration. Each enzyme has an optimal pH where it functions most efficiently. For example, enzymes involved in human cellular respiration generally work best around a neutral pH, around pH 7. If the pH moves significantly away from this optimal range, the enzyme's activity will decrease, slowing down the respiration process. And finally, substrate concentration is another limiting factor. The concentration of respiratory substrates, such as glucose and oxygen, has a direct impact on the rate of respiration, particularly because respiration is an enzyme-catalyzed process. The rate of respiration depends on how frequently enzymes and substrates collide and form enzyme-substrate complexes. At low substrate concentrations, there are fewer substrate molecules available to collide with the enzymes. As a result, the rate of reaction is slower because the enzymes are not fully utilised. As substrate concentration increases, more substrate molecules are available to bind to enzymes, leading to more enzyme-substrate collisions. This increases the rate of respiration. At high substrate concentrations, the rate of respiration increases until it reaches a point where all the enzyme active sites are occupied by substrate molecules. This is called substrate saturation. At this point, adding more substrate will not further increase the rate of reaction because all enzymes are already working at their maximum capacity. The maximum rate of reaction, Vmax, is the point where increasing substrate concentration no longer increases the rate of respiration. The enzyme is saturated and the rate is limited by the number of enzyme molecules available. So how can we measure the rate of respiration? The rate of respiration in small organisms can be measured using respirometers or manometers, like the one shown here. Respiration rate is determined by measuring the uptake of oxygen over a set period, or the release of carbon dioxide.
In this setup, the right hand tube contains the respiring organisms, plant or animal. The left hand control tube contains glass beads, which occupy the same volume as the organisms, ensuring that the two tubes are comparable apart from the respiration occurring in the tube with the organisms. To set up the experiment, the tubes are sealed with bungs. Before sealing, the clips on the apparatus are left open to allow excess air to escape, accounting for the volume of the bungs. Once the bungs are in place, the clips are closed to make the system airtight. Inside the tubes, potassium hydroxide, or an alternative like soda lime, is used to absorb carbon dioxide produced during respiration. This is crucial because aerobic respiration uses the same volume of oxygen as the volume of carbon dioxide released. Without absorbing the carbon dioxide, there would be no detectable change in gas volume within the respirometer. However, when the carbon dioxide is absorbed, the gas volume decreases as oxygen is consumed, allowing the oxygen uptake to be measured. The connected manometer tube, which contains a liquid, measures the change in gas volume. As the organisms respire, the air pressure inside the sealed tube decreases, causing the manometer fluid to move towards the tube containing the respiring organisms. By measuring the distance the fluid moves and knowing the diameter of the capillary tube, you can calculate the volume of oxygen consumed. The rate of oxygen uptake provides a direct measure of the rate of aerobic respiration. The faster the oxygen is consumed, the higher the rate of respiration. To ensure accurate results, the entire apparatus is placed in a water bath to maintain a constant temperature. This prevents temperature fluctuations from affecting the gas volume as changes in temperature could alter the pressure and rate of respiration and confound the measurements. And so we come towards the end of this key concept video on cellular respiration for the core syllabus points of IB biology. I will leave you with a summary of what we have covered in the video. The key terms are highlighted. Remember to use these in your written answers.